the safe harbor negotiations and the recent uh, um, announcement a couple, just a couple just yesterday, I guess, on, on uh, the privacy shield. So we're really pleased uh, that you can join us. Uh, Commissioner Brill has been at the FTC now for a number of years and has really emerged as a leading uh, voice, not just on privacy policy, uh, but has been a leading uh, negotiator and uh, representative of the U.S. government in the interest in negotiation in Brussels. So, Julie, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for doing this on such a, in such a timely fashion. There you go. <laughs> We're just in time, think tank. Yes, yes. Uh, so we will uh, probably adjourn around 10.45 or so, and also for those of you who want to uh, send a question in that I will be able to see on Twitter, uh, just use the hashtag uh, privacy shield. So I'm going to first of all say, uh, obviously we've been reading about the text and hearing about it, but the full text is not public, so I'm not going to ask you to go into specific details that haven't been made public, but I wonder if you could just give us an overview of the new agreement. We've had the safe harbor for 15 years now. Obviously there was the challenge uh, in the European Court of Justice, come back to the drawing board. Can you lay out sort of what, what happened? What did we all agree on and then where are we? Sure, happy to. And again, thank you for organizing this. It's a pleasure to try to, you know, um, talk about uh, these issues and give more transparency to it. Of course, as you know and you alluded to, but I just want to make sure the audience is aware. There are some things that I, I just won't be able to talk about, and some of these uh, involve the details, um, because they're still being worked out, and uh, it's important that the folks who are sitting down and now will be putting uh, pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and actually um, uh, you know, writing the words up, you have the freedom to do that. Um, this has been an ongoing negotiation that's, that was taking place much, uh, much prior to the Schrems decision. So of course the ECJ decision um, had a very big impact on the discussions because I think both sides wanted to ensure that the elements of the agreement would meet the court's standard as best could be done and also withstand further scrutiny, um, which may come uh, through, through uh, further actions. Uh, but the discussions really began uh, in around 2013, after the Snowden revelations, when uh, the European Commission, through DG Justice, sent a letter to, the, to various um, folks within the US government saying, we need to reevaluate in light of the allegations that have been made regarding surveillance. And so that began a process. So it's been going on for about two years. Um, it's been very intense, needless to say, uh, because the challenges are big on both sides of the Atlantic. I think there's a des great desire um, on both sides of the Atlantic to protect privacy, to protect consumers, but also to balance that with national security. Sure. Um, everybody wants to be secure, and everybody knows that there are a lot of bad guys out there. So the question is, how do you strike the appropriate proportionate balance? Um, the, as I said, the documents haven't been finalized yet, but the parties to, at the negotiating table have talked about the agreement in, in broad terms. So in broad terms, on the commercial side, uh, the agreement will provide for <coughs> stronger FTC DPA cooperation through clearer referral mechanisms and also annual reviews, things like that. Um, by the way, when I talk about DPAs, I'm talking about the European Data Protection Authorities. We are also a data protection authority, but I'll call us the FTC, just to make those okay. terms clear. Now when you're saying commercial, you're talking about just the commercial practices that used to be covered under Safe Harbor. Exactly. The, the principles that companies would need to um, uh, agree to if they're going to voluntarily join Safe Harbor and how the mechanism will work from a, on the commercial side, as we call it. And that's in contradistinction to the national security issues that were also um, dealt with through this agreement. So stronger FTC DPA cooperation through these clear referral mechanisms and through, excuse me, annual uh, discussions about how, how it's working and, and reporting and, and talking about it. Another issue that uh, came up and was something that everybody worked very hard to address was how will individual uh, consumer complaints uh, be dealt with? That is, if an individual in Europe believes that a company that is a part of the privacy shield will um, has not abided by the principles of the privacy shield, how will that complaint be heard? And there are f at least four 
um, mechanisms that were discussed to ensure that that European's complaint will be addressed. They can go directly to the company itself. They can use um, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, which will now be free, which is something that I and others have been advocating for a while. Uh, they can uh, uh, complain through the DPAs, that is the DPAs in Europe. That's, when you say they'll be free, will they be paid for by the company then, the complaint company? Um, I assume, well, you know, I, I think those details will be worked out, but I, I believe that most of the companies have been paying for their ADR service, their alternative dispute resolution service. So I'm not sure that that will change. But right, the, the, it has to be free to the consumer, sure. to the, to the, to the mm -hmm. complainant. Um, so uh, they can go directly to the companies. They can use <clears throat> the um, ADR mechanism that will be set up uh, uh, through Privacy Shield. They can go to their DPA. Uh, the DPA can refer to the FTC, assuming it's sort of a legitimate and important complaint that the DPA is, for one reason or another, having trouble navigating. Ultimately, though, if the individual is not satisfied, there will be an arbitration mechanism, a direct arbitration mechanism. So there's a number of different ways that, that um, consumers can have their uh, complaints heard. And that was a very important issue to the Europeans. And mm -hmm. I, I believe the US um, understood the importance of the issue. And I, I believe responded very well to the concerns. Um, other <clears throat> broad outlines, again, on the commercial side. Um, there will not only be reviews by uh, the FTC and the DPAs, but also, importantly, the Department of Commerce and the European Commission will have annual reviews of the program to ensure that it's running well. There'll be an important role for the Department of Commerce in terms of playing kind of a traffic cop to ensure that referrals are going to the right place. Also, to if, if there are complaints that maybe we might call low-hanging fruit that can be dealt with re relatively easily, the Department of Commerce will have a role in dealing directly with companies to try to ensure that those are cleaned up. And uh, I, it was discussed um, yesterday on a, in a Twitter chat that um, the Department of Commerce's team will be beefed up even further uh, to deal with these issues. Um, the principles themselves, I think, will, uh, you know, again, much needs to be worked out. But one of the very important mechanisms that has already been discussed, or one of the important principles that's been discussed, is the onward transfer issue. And with respect to onward transfer, uh, there will be stronger protections there. And that was also something important to the Europeans. Quickly on the surveillance side, um, you know, the, uh, the intelligence community, as has been discussed, has laid out for the Europeans the type of constitutional, statutory, and uh, administrative slash policy safeguards that are in place, as well as those that have been put in place um, over the past two years through USA Freedom, through the Presidential Policy Directive 28, and through many, many other efforts. Um, so that was important because I think, you know, and I know we'll probably get to this, I've spent a lot of time in Europe trying to explain to Europeans how our privacy system works. It's not easy for them to understand. Frankly, I don't blame them because lots of Americans don't understand it. It's a complex system. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I know for sure is as, uh, the DPAs um, especially had a real need to understand what has happened over the past two years on the national security side. They heard things, but they, they really needed to have it spelled out. And I think that the intelligence community, again, I'm not at the table when those conversations are taking place, but uh, it, and the FTC is not at the table when those conversations are taking place, but I think that the intelligence community has made a real effort to, to reach out and to try to explain all that has happened. And I think that that has been a very productive conversation. Um, but importantly, one of the things that was discussed will, is that there will be an ombudsman uh, put in place for European citizens who will have a channel to raise questions about um, signals intelligence activities uh, that might be relating to Privacy Shield. And I think that that's going to be very important as a, as a redress mechanism. And that'll be a US ombudsman or a yes. European? Yes. I, I believe it will be an ombudsman that is here mm -hmm. within the US government. <clears throat> I'm not sure whether it's been disclosed exactly where that person will be placed. Mm -hmm but it will be a person here in the United States who will be receiving uh, complaints from European citizens about uh, signals intelligence issues that might arise under Privacy Shield.
Good. So I think that that's an important element too. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So um, given the fact that um, there's a new role here, and there's new, there's sort of beefed up, if you will, uh, provisions both on the commercial side and the and the uh, national security side. Did you see the FTC role changing in any way? Uh, did it kind of maybe more beefed up, more active, or? I, you know, we have always taken. Well, strike that. Let me start over. In the past uh, four or five years, we've taken very active role in terms of safe harbor enforcement. Uh, we have always said we will take referrals from DPAs. Um, we will uh, uh, give them a very high priority. Um, there's been <clears throat> some discussion in Twitter and elsewhere about how many referrals we've received. We, we believe we've only received four in the past uh, 15 years. Um, Isabel Falk Paratin, uh, a good friend of mine who runs Article 29 uh, Working Party, says that there have been more. And I'm not, I don't doubt her. There may have been DPAs who have intended to send us referrals. The fact that there's this um, you know, discussion about mm -hmm. how many we've received points to the very fact that it was important to set up a clear mechanism to ensure that the DPAs complaints do get to us and we see them and we know that they have been received. Um, so <clears throat> I think our enforcement role is the same. We will strongly enforce um, entities that uh, self-certify that they will be a part of Privacy Shield and that we will ensure that they live up to the principles, which will be more robust, um, that they will live up to the principles of Privacy Shield. Uh, and we will continue to, you know, when we are examining companies for other privacy or data security issues, we will look to see whether they are a part of Privacy Shield, just as we have been doing. Because we hadn't been getting referrals, you know, we looked for problems ourselves. And we've brought 39 cases to date uh, for those who were violating Safe Harbor. It's true, the vast majority of those cases dealt with uh, whether the registration was appropriate, whether people were appropriately saying, companies were appropriately saying they were part of Safe Harbor or not part of Safe Harbor. But we have had a few cases that were substantive and dealt with the substantive principles, mm -hmm. including some cases against very big, mm -hmm. very big players. We also had our case against Trustee, which was a, or is a SEAL program, um, dealing with whether or not they were um, appropriately monitoring companies in the way that they claimed that they sure. were, which was a very, in my view, a very important case. So we will continue to robustly enforce the, because the principles are more um, robust. You know, we will be um, ensuring that those principles uh, uh, will be lived up to by everyone who signs up. Um, so I think the element that has been strengthened is not so much our enforcement, but the communication mechanism cooperation. Uh, and the cooperate exactly between the DPAs and the FTC. So there's a lot of, uh, I, maybe uncertainty is the wrong word, but there's still a lot of moving parts. The agreement has to actually get written down. The DPAs have to approve it. There's then the potential of a, of a some going back to a court, potentially the ECJ. Uh, Schrems has sort of implied that, uh, which one level is not surprising that he would, that he would imply that. But can you just talk us through a little bit about how you see the next few, four or five months going? What's the process? Sure. So <clears throat> on this side, can I just say on this side of the Atlantic, before we get to the European yeah. side, on this side of the Atlantic, there still are s not only, of course, does the agreement need to be um, you know, put in play, the, 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 the details need to be written up, and everyone needs to look at it. Um, but on this side of the Atlantic, there are still some very important steps that need to be taken. For instance, and the one I just want to highlight for you and for the audience that may be listening, is the Judicial Redress sure. Act. Um, <clears throat> the Judicial Redress Act is currently pending uh, in the Senate. Uh, I think it is uh, an important element, not just for the umbrella agreement, which is something that the FTC doesn't really have a role in, but it is very important that that um, be enacted uh, for the purposes of Privacy Shield as well. Mm -hmm. So there's work to be done on this side of the Atlantic, too. Um, on the other side of the Atlantic, so the immediate <clears throat> next step, as I understand it, is of course, as you pointed out, to write up the details uh, so that everyone can see it, and in particular so that the DPAs can see it. Um, uh, Article 29 Working Party, which is 
I know your audience is a very highly educated group. You should explain it. Just because I've, I've thrown, yes. I'm throwing these terms around and I apologize for those um, who may not be as familiar with it as, as I have come to be. Article 29 Working Party is the college of all of the data protection authorities, um, more or less within the European Union, uh, who um, come together and uh, look at policy issues together. They also have the ability, although they haven't used it that much, but are starting to, they have the ability to do enforcement work together, um, whether it's under the Article 29 umbrella or whether one or more of them together will decide to take a case. And, and they have done that, and I believe we'll start to see much more of that, certainly once the GDPR, <coughs> excuse me, the new General Data Protection Regulation kicks in, because that has an explicit role for uh, the article, the, the group that uh, the group of the DPAs to do much more in mm -hmm. terms of enforcement cooperation, but so sorry for that digression. Back to next steps. They, the Article Twenty Nine has said that they would like to see the, the paperwork within the next month, uh, and then they will have a plenary session in early March to review um, the Privacy Shield principles and all of the letters and the agreements and make a determination as to whether um, they believe that it lives up to the principles that they have articulated, um, which they draw from the Schrems decision. Um, <clears throat> there was, I thought, uh, very promising words uh, spoken by um, Isabel Falk Perotin at her press conference the other day saying that, you know, these things appear promising, but she needs to see it in writing. And I don't blame her. We all want to see it sure. in writing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that will be the immediate, I believe that's the first immediate next step. <clears throat> but this process is going to be more complicated than it was in the year 2000. In the year 2000, before the Lisbon Treaty, um, the European Commission had the ability to uh, enter into an agreement with the United States, or framework back then, with uh, the United States and uh, say that <clears throat> this was an adequate transfer mechanism and it was launched. Now, uh, the process is more complicated. The European Parliament has an advisory role. It will um, have the ability to review and to um, have some kind of a vote. I don't know that that's binding, but of course it's very important sure. for many <coughs> players that the European Parliament understand what a, one, what a great step forward this is and hopefully will agree that the principles really are um, uh, more robust. So the European Parliament will have a role. Um, the member states will have a role. Um, well, first, I, I guess first, the, the European Commission as a whole will need to approve it. Uh, the European Parliament will have an advisory role, but then it will go to the member states, and the member states will also have to approve uh, the, the new privacy shield. So the, the, the process will be... Um, Is that uh, individually or through the, uh, the council? Well. That's a good question. My understanding is it's actually individually, okay. but um, but I'm, but I'm, I could be wrong about okay. that. But I do Sounds know that, like it is. I, I, that that's been my sense yeah. uh, that it actually has to go to the member states right. themselves, and it's not through the council. Right. right. Okay. So um, we didn't talk about uh, it, if it were to go to court. Let's just say all the DPAs agree and everybody's on board, right. and then there's a challenge. Right. Um, we, as an organization, didn't feel that the ECJ decision was as, uh, or maybe the Irish court decision really, was as transparent and, and, and reflective of the evidence as it might have been. But there clearly has been changes since that uh, that, that are material changes. Uh, and particularly, hopefully, if judicial redress gets passed, that that'll be another material change. And I know you may not be able to predict or even comment on it, but maybe to sort of talk about how do you think the Europeans will look at this, the fact that we have made real changes, right. uh, and that the, the, and first of all, the perception of Snowden was never, as, the reality of Snowden was never as bad as the perception, and we did make a lot of serious, important changes in the last year or two, uh, and, and hopefully now, how do you think that's all going to play out? Will it matter? Well, without adopting the premise in some of your some parts we'll of your leave question, that first part, we'll, leave, yes. we'll leave that. But yes. but let me. Um, there's two parts to your question, and I want to address both of them. Um, one is, what was the project that the ECJ had before it when it decide, when it made, entered into the Schrems decision? Because I think it's important to understand that it was not at that time undertaking an evaluation of all the changes that had been made 
from the, to the time of the Snowden revelations to the time it entered into its decision. In other words, it was it was kind of like it, it's sort of like a motion to dismiss. I mean, trying to put this into sort of American terms for for the lawyers out there, or, or basically like a decision on the papers, which is the way that, that their system works. That is, they were looking at the allegations that were in. Uh, frankly, the um, European Commission's and DG Justice's 2013 letter, and they were saying, if those allegations are true, you know, these issues have not, were not addressed in the year 2000 when the initial uh, safe harbor decision right. had been entered into. So it was not a project to evaluate all that has been going on in the United States, especially in the last two years, to try to get the balance of, you know, proportionality in terms of uh, surveillance and things like that, but more aligned with right. how we Americans want to see it, right. frankly. Um, so that's important. I, I, I think that there's been kind of confusion um, about, you know, did the court sort of ignore all of these facts? It's not so much that it ignored it, but that just wasn't its project. It wasn't, it wasn't on its mandate. It, it, it was not their sure. mandate. It was, it was, they were looking at the allegations. Right. I think, um, I do agree there will likely be court challenges. I mean, nobody knows for sure, but you know, we, we all know that there have been tweets about that already. I also know that the DPAs had, you know, right after the Schrems decision, started to receive a number of other types of complaints. So I have no doubt that in some form or another there will, there will be court challenges. Um, so we'll have to see how those go, but I believe that most of those, it would be, it would be, helpful if those took into account, I think, all that has happened. Absolutely. And it seems that now would be the time yeah. to do that. Yeah. But, um, so I wanted to just clarify that. Yeah. In terms of, you know, do Europeans understand all that has happened, which is the second part of your question, um, and that, I, I view that as more broad than just the court, sure. right? So now you're, you're talking about do the DPAs understand, do the European Commission understand? I believe the answer to that is those who are, have been at the table who have been deeply involved in these discussions at the European Commission, that is within within um, the DG Justice uh, part of the Commission, I think they do understand. It's you know been two years of, of negotiations, and right. there's been a lot of information right. that has been put forward to them. Um, similarly, the DPAs, um, they hadn't understood, as I said, there was a lacuna of information that they were that they felt they had and the um, intelligence community has really been trying to reach out to them as well. And I think more of that will happen. But this, this is a broader conversation that needs to take place. Um, as I said, Parliament's going to have a role, so the members of Parliament will need to understand all that has taken place. I think um, you know, the public at large will need to understand. Mm -hmm. And if I can switch from all that has happened on the national security side, I also want to talk about all that we do on what I call the commercial side, that is what it is that the FTC looks at. Um, again, we have a complicated privacy framework in the United States. Um, it's not one black letter law, uh, so it's different from how many of the European countries are de deal with privacy. But as I say uh, when I go to Europe, and I spend a lot of time doing this, it is different, but it is very protective. Um, and there are some ways in which our system, I believe, is more protective. Sure. And if you'll forgive me, I would like to give one example. Um, because I recently learned that we have something that I think is so important for consumers uh, in the privacy data protection space uh, that doesn't exist in here. And it comes under the Credit Reporting Act, and it's the Adverse Action Notice. Do you know what this is? No. Okay. So, Right, it takes a wonk like me who's been doing this for 25 years, and it took, and I only it only dawned on me. I've been having these discussions for five years. It dawned on me only in December um, that they don't have this. So, Credit Reporting Act is so so our our framework is such that Congress has decided when there is uh, sensitive information at hand, they will enact laws, and they did have enacted laws to protect that sensitive information children's information, financial information, health information, uh, uh, educational information under FERPA. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting one or another. Um, and credit. And now to credit. So with respect to, the, to credit information, it's information that is used to make decisions about consumers for 
loans, insurance, housing, and jobs. Uh, very critical uh, uh, areas. And it's information that is collected and sold or given by entities, not just that self-identify as a credit reporting agency, but any entity that's engaged in this practice. And some of the actions that we have taken in the, in, at the FTC is against entities that were engaged in fair credit reporting activities and they just didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. So we said, sorry, you were subject to that law and you didn't live up to the, to the elements of it. Okay, adverse action notice is required to be given to consumers when a credit report, that is this information, this data, is used to, um, to give them higher, to, to charge them more for their loans, more for their insurance, to deny them a loan, or to deny them insurance, or to deny them a promotion, or deny them a job. You know, really sensitive, important stuff. They are required to be given a notice, just-in-time notice, that goes to them and says, there's something in your credit report that has led us to charge you more for your loan or to deny you the job, et cetera, et cetera. And then consumers can say, oh my gosh, this credit report's actually really important. I better go check it out. And I better go see whether it's accurate or whether there's something in there that actually is, isn't right. Mm -hmm. Very, very important notice. Doesn't exist in Europe. It doesn't exist at all. So, okay, again, walk like me. I think the adverse action notice is a really critical piece of our privacy framework. Um, the, it doesn't exist in Europe. They do have credit reporting agencies, and it's just that, you know, as my friends who I was having this discussion with back in December said, is just they'll, they'll be denied a loan or denied a job or charge more for insurance or charge more for a loan, and they just won't know why. So, this is not to say we're better than Europe. Yeah, we each it's have just strengths. to say we, exactly, we each have strengths and weaknesses, and I think. Uh, how, how long did it take me to explain this? The three, four minutes? It takes a while, and this is just one tiny component sure. of, of U.S. Right. law. Right. So I think it, it, it's a constant conversation that I think we need to have on both sides of the Atlantic in order to ensure that we really do understand our strengths and weaknesses and right. can have a real intelligent and honest conversation a, about that. Well, that goes to this whole sort of broader question of the, we, we just have to have, you know, I know it sounds trite, but we, we just have to have better and more sustained dialogue. Absolutely. Have each other Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me, uh, let me turn to uh, uh, um, a, a couple of questions sure. here um, from some media. Um, so one is, um, how will consumers know how to make a complaint with so many different options? You've got Ombudsman DPA. So you're a, you're a European consumer. That's a funny that's a funny question because the concern was just the opposite. So I'm sorry. I, I, I think I may have cut you off. No, no, okay. that's fine. Um, I, I think uh, more options is better than than fewer options. My my belief, and this is a personal belief, um, the the DPA tradition is very strong in Europe, and my belief is that most consumers will go to their DPA. So a, um, someone in the UK will go to the ICO, someone in France will go to the CNIL, someone in Germany will go to one of the Landers DPAs or the federal DPA if it deals somehow with the federal government. I think that will probably be the first option. Sure. But um, there will be, uh, all of this will be spelled out, and I believe in very user-friendly terms, mm -hmm. um, on the Department of Commerce website and hopefully our website as well. And I should say, it's very important that this information be made clear on websites in Europe, that is, all the DPA's website sure. and the Commission's website. I feel that you know the Department of Commerce you know, has ha had work to do with respect to its website. It has already done that work and really improved it well before this agreement um, has been reached. Uh, I think that more communication about these mechanisms and the transparency needs to happen with respect to European websites. Yeah. Well, obviously, with all the press this is going to get to, people will become aware of it. I think they, that's true, too. But I think, it's import I think it's important to have uh, online tools that sure. are very usable for consumers. So, um, I'm going to ask the point of clarification, which was referring back to your comments sure. I think a little earlier. Has the FTC missed complaints from the DPA? In other words, you, there was a sort of there may be more, but okay. and then and then is that because they didn't get to you or because you missed? Them I, I I honestly so the short answer is I don't know. We think we had four. Yeah. Isabel Falkaparaten 
says there were more, and she hasn't identified how many. I honestly think that this is not a dispute yeah, not worth the, it's, having. It's a, this is not the, the old, issue. The old debate, this the is old issue. Well, she could be right, we could be right. Yeah. We don't know yeah. what the answer is. Yeah. But what we do know is that it points to the need to have a clear mechanism to ensure that if we missed some, we'll get them. If they fail to send them to us, they will know how to, they, the European DPAs, will know how to do it. That's the point. The point isn't this, it's not even a dispute. It's just, we yeah. really don't know. Right. We really don't know. And the new process will help. It, the new process will, will, I believe, will very much help in this regard. And I think that that's the key point. Yeah. So I have a question here from uh, someone in the media, which is what I was going to ask, okay. which is really, for if you're a company who's been involved with this, having to deal with this you know, moving data across uh, borders, uh, is there going to be any interim guidance? When, where are companies right now between now and X in the future? Are they in limbo? How, how much assurance can they get that they're not going to get uh, they're not going to get fined or something like that right now? Where, where is that process? It's a good question. Um, we we have said that if companies are continuing to make um, promises that they're abiding by the old safe harbor, that we will enforce that. In other words, even if the safe harbor is not a valid transfer mechanism, companies can still say, we're abiding by these principles because they're, they're very important principles. And you know, if someone is going to say that they're abiding by principles, we're going to hold them to that. Um, the Europeans. Uh, both the court as well as the DPAs have said that safe harbor is not a valid transfer mechanism at this time. However, they have said, my understanding is that they're holding in abeyance uh, enforcement actions while they undergo this evaluation. So I think companies uh, need to evaluate what type of mechanisms they should be using or and they can use. There are binding corporate rules and there are standard contractual clauses, which I, I can get into the details. I, I know we have a very educated audience. But to be fair, those are complicated that, well, and what I, longer that's, well, what I was gonna What I was going to say is all that is true, but also they're not going to necessarily be appropriate for all data transfers that are taking place <coughs> now, um, as well as being uh, complicated and expensive particularly, uh, well, both of them in, in their own way can be expensive and complicated. So um, I think right now we're in a period of evaluation, evaluation of what the appropriate mechanisms are going to be going forward. I think Article 29 will give a very fair evaluation of the privacy shield. And uh, if it were to say, which I'm very hopeful it will, that it is for now and it's, we've got the mechanisms in place that we need and it's appropriate transfer mechanism, then companies can transition to Privacy Shield. What they'll have to do is examine these more robust obligations that they're sure. going to have. And they're going to need to, the companies are going to need to make sure that they can abide by them once they self-certify. Um, and I, I want companies to examine them closely because I want them to be sure that when they self-certify that they're abiding by privacy shield, they know, they, what they're doing they, they, know they know what they're doing, they know what they're getting into. Yeah. So again, you may, it's sort of like, uh, I'm a lawyer, but I can't give legal advice kind of question here. Still though, you know, when you say the, the, uh, the uh, data protection authorities are sort of agreeing not to prosecute now or yes. anything like that, well, could they retroactively, you know, in other words, our companies, well, we're not going to do anything now, but if it turns out this agreement doesn't work and you've transferred data between February 1st and whenever, we might go back. And, and that's obviously a high level of uncertainty. Look, this, this is a, a time, this evaluation time, there is uncertainty. Um, I'm not enough of a European legal expert to be able to tell you sitting here that none of the DPAs could retroactively enforce. Mm -hmm. The lo their laws are different. Right now they're operating under a directive which allows each of the member states to have different laws dealing with these issues. They're not, they're, they're a heterogeneous group. Sure. Um, my, my hope would be that they would understand that everyone is being very respectful of their evaluation, wants them to have the time and the ability to evaluate 
privacy shield and as a result everybody is, is waiting and uh, I, I hope there would not be retroactive enforcement. Um, I understand the audience would love me to say there won't be retroactive enforcement, but that's not my job. Sure, that's sure. not my job. And it would be rude of me to presume that I know the answer to that sure. question. Well, that relates to the, the um, 28 data protection authority. Uh, approximately. Right. Yes. Well, and then you've got the lander ones as well. And are they all, is, is Again, you may just not know this yet, but is the, is the goal for them to all sort of come to an agreement at the same time? Or could you end up with a system where the Germans say yes and the, the Dutch say no? It's an interesting question. I don't know. You know, they, um, I don't know how the DPAs work. Uh, in the sense of Article 29, seems to be a consensus body. Um, whether they'll take a vote on this or otherwise, I, 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 I don't. Yeah. I honestly don't know. Yeah. Um, and whether there'll be dissenting opinions or whatnot, but they, they have always operated, it appears, through consensus. Just as you mentioned the Landers DPAs, the German DPAs. Um, I met with them back in December. Um, I think I'm the first US government person. We're an independent agency, of course. We, I don't represent the administration. But I think I'm the first person that met with them as a group in the college of German DPAs. There were a few who were not present. Um, but those who were present, um, were, first of all, it was a great meeting. Um, because as you may know, I have a state background and they are essentially state Vermont, regulators. Exactly. Vermont and North Carolina yeah. for many, many years yeah. before I became a commissioner. We had a lot in common. And I was also able to describe to them a very important book that has recently come out called Privacy on the Ground, which shows that in the largest companies, the chief privacy officers in the United States and Germany excuse me, in Germany, have more in common than do the chief privacy officers in the largest companies of Germany, the UK, France, and Spain. In other words, there is a lot of commonality between how privacy is practiced on the ground in the US and Germany. They were fascinated to hear yeah. that. But, th but um, they uh, were very interested in seeing a new data transfer mechanism put in place. They were not excited about the idea of having to review all of these mechanisms um, and making a determination about whether the practices you know lived up to the Schrenz decision they felt that this was a political decision that needed to be made so that they could do their job of sure. protecting consumers under whatever framework was deemed to be appropriate right. so I think um, you know and that was you know, again back in December my sense is that many of the DPAs really want to have a framework in place so that they can do their job. Um, there's going to be a big question. I, everyone's been talking about, you know, how will we ensure that consumers' complaints will be heard, the European consumers' complaints will be heard, and how will we ensure that, you know, it will get, you know, get to a final adjudication. And I think this arbitration panel will solve that problem. No one has been talking about the DPA resource issue. And I think this is a huge, huge issue. And by that, it's not just with respect to safe harbor, excuse me, privacy shield enforcement. Forgive me. I, I hope I've said it correctly throughout. I may have had a slip here and there. Forgive me. We'll all have to have the new lexicon. Absolutely, absolutely. But the privacy shield enforcement is going to be significant. But also add to that in new enforcement authority under the GDPR. Uh, this issue about resource is tremendous. You can have all the rights and duties written down on paper, but if you don't have the resources to actually enforce sure. and to do something right. about it, that's a big problem. And well, that's been historically sort of the argument that we, it, maybe our laws aren't quite as strict, but we do a much better job of enforcement. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you agree with that, but that's what you I, I, I believe. Sense. I believe that we do a very good job at enforcement. Um, I don't want to get into better or worse, yeah. but we, I believe we do a very good job at enforcement. Um, Part of that's resources, but part of that is our enforcement culture here in the sure. United States. I believe that you know we, uh, especially the FTC, we are an ex post agency, largely speaking. Um, you know, we do write a few rules uh, when authorized by Congress or when we need to, and we have uh, dealt with uh, rulemaking. But you know, one of the differences between us and, for instance, the FCC is you know we are very much an, an ex post agency. We look at activity afterwards, and we say. 
does this fit our broad framework of is it unfair, is it deceptive, or has it violated some of these specific right, laws? Right. So I want to ask you um, again, and may, may not, well, we'll see. Uh, just ask. I'll, I if I just, can't answer it, I, I won't just answer it. Ask. <laughs> I uh, had the pleasure of testifying in the House Judiciary Committee in December, I believe, on cross border data flows. And, and one of the things I discovered when I was writing my testimony was that. Um, well, I knew this, but what I, that Europe also has safe harbor-like agreements with other regions, other countries. And one is with Israel, and one is, one is yes. with Argentina. Yes. Uh, Isle of Man. Isle of Man. And others, yes. And you have Angora. to sort of question whether the Israeli system of government access to data is as the protections are as robust as ours, uh, that we have, I think, a stronger set of rules, rule of law, and ju judicial review. Um, there doesn't seem to be any evidence, any push to end the Israeli agreement. And I just, how much of this, well, I mean, do you think the Europeans are going to be looking more broadly at this question, or are they just really just going to continue to focus on us? So I don't, I, I'm not going to get into the particular nations that you mentioned or that, or that, I, that I mentioned. I don't think that would be appropriate or fair. Um, I look if if Europe and the United States can't work out a way to um, transfer data in a dynamic, fluid through a dynamic fluid mechanism that will allow all ships to rise, that will allow the data economy to grow on both sides of the Atlantic, then we're in big we're trouble. In big trouble. We're in big trouble. So I think this bridge that we have built, and there are more bridges that need to be built, but this very important bridge that has been built is a tremendous step forward. And it will be, I believe, I, I, I hope, it will be a model for potentially other nations as well. I mean, your your question could go not just to well, the- internally. Exactly, that's what I was going yeah. to say. Your question could go to an analysis <coughs> of what the member states in Europe are doing and whether they would live up to the Schrems uh, standard. And that gets to the question of what is the Schrems standard. And there's been a lot of discussion about that. I've given some speeches about it. Others have given speeches about it. It's been a discussion, needless to say, at the negotiating table and, and many, many other places. You know, this, the standard that the Schrems court articulated was, will the third country, ha does it have uh, principles that are essentially equivalent to the European order? Now, we tend to talk a lot about the essential equivalence part, but the other part is equally important. It, to the European legal order and the question, or the EU, excuse me, the EU legal order is I believe what, what it mm -hmm. says. The question is what is the EU legal order? Is it the platonic ideal, as I say, you know, as written out in the charters, uh, you know, fundamental rights, human rights, is that the European legal order? Or is the European legal order how practices are actually taking place on the ground within the member states? And this gets to something that I, I was forced to discuss in Brussels when I was debating my good friend Paul Nimitz. Um, you know, it, to a certain extent, there's a little bit of a catch-22 here because many of the European institutions, that is the European Union institutions, are not competent to deal with national security issues of the member states. Um, yeah. Although the, the European Court of Human Rights is and is starting to look at some of these questions vis-a-vis -vis some of the countries. Um, but the European Court of Justice is not, the European Commission is not, most if not all of the DPAs are not competent to deal with this. And yet they're analyzing what's happening in the U.S. pursuant to the Schrems decision, both in terms, well, the Schrems decision was all about national security and government right. access. Right. It had nothing to do, as your audience and you very well know, nothing to do with the, what we call the commercial lane, right. that is whether the company at issue, which wasn't even mentioned in the decision, was actually complying with the principles and whether the principles of then safe harbor were appropriate. Right. It was all about national right. security. So there's a little bit of a catch-22 here. Having said that, I believe this is an incredibly important bridge that we have gotten over and there are more bridges to come, but I'm hopeful that this could be um, a way in which, whether it's other countries or whether it's member states within the European Union, but it will be a way in which all of us can say, you know, here's what's needed to be proportionate pursuant to the Schrems decision. Yeah. There, there was a recent article, uh, maybe November, where the German 
intelligence agency in the US, was looking at data on uh, privacy, sensitive information on Danish citizens um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without real sort of redress and all. And there was a, is that problem? Well, is it all in Europe? It's not a problem. And I, I think that is something that has to end up getting worked Absolutely. out. Absolutely. And there, my understanding is there are a few cases working their way through the Strasbourg Court um, that are dealing with this issue, the, the Euro European Court for Human Rights. They're dealing with this issue as well. So um, a couple of interesting questions here from, from reporters. One is um, you talked about the more, that, that both DOC, FTC will be doing more. There will be more bodies, if you will. Is that funding going to require some kind of increase in appropriations or internal reallocation, or you don't know? Yet? I don't know. Okay. Do we have questions from uh, interested? I'm, I'm happy to answer reporters' questions, but from either companies or citizens or I am consumer just sort groups. Of I'd, be, I'd love to answer some of their questions too. Right. Maybe they're shyer. Right. I, will, <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to answer reporters' questions. That was questions. actually not a reporter question. Oh, okay, good. good, so, good, good. And uh, if, there, if there are other ones, please uh, just send them in here. I just like to be give equal time. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just reading the ones I see. Okay. Um, this one I think is it, it, interesting. Uh, you alluded to this a little bit, and again, it may be hard to know exactly, but what do U.S. businesses, what are they going to need to do differently with regard to privacy shield so, on the commercial side? So um, I, I can't talk about all of that, but one of the things that has already been discussed is um, more robust protections with respect to onward transfer. That's the term that's used. So privacy shield will have more protections in place with respect to controllers uh, that have Europeans' data and transfer it onward to a third entity, a third, another controller or a processor. Onward transfer will be uh, more strongly um, protected. It can still exist, but it has oh, yes. to, so there still have to be Absolutely. a framework of stronger Absolutely. rules around Ex it. Uh, it, it. There will have to be more assurances that the entity that's receiving that data will need to, to, to protect it as well, yeah. pursuant to the principles. Yeah. I um, wrote an op-ed in, uh, in a European uh, Brussels uh, magazine um, right before the, a couple of days before the privacy directive was finalized. And I sort of threw out For a... For the directive or the GDPR? The GDPR. Oh, oh okay. GDPR. I was going to say, how, okay, so that was a while. Okay, yeah, the, got it. The GDPR. Uh, and I throw it, took, you know, a little, little bit of a, you know, sort of bold idea, I guess. And I, and, and essentially... I, I argued that they should sort of scrap the adequacy directive and move towards a sort of standard of care directive. In other words, that if you were a U.S. company doing business in Europe and you had legal nexus, in yes. other words, as opposed to, to something, I, I, you know, maybe I can, we might not have legal nexus there, but, uh, you know, Visa does, Citibank does, Ford Motor Company, Boeing, they all, in that case, why not just say that European law applies to them, and if they come bring data over to the U.S. and they abuse it under European law, then they can get sued because of their legal connection in Europe. And that really you don't even need for the commercial side <coughs> that the adequacy part could be replaced by this by this doctrine of care notion. Well, you were prescient, as you know, because well, the GDPR does expand the jurisdictional reach of the DPAs and, and basically the jurisdictional reach of the, the, the new regulation that will be put into place. We all know it still needs implementation at the member state level. There will still be um, more to come in terms of all of the nuanced uh, requirements. Um, but the GDPR definitely does expand the notion of when it will apply to companies, even companies that don't have a physical presence in uh, Europe but are receiving information about Europeans. That is absolutely true. That has happened. I don't think they've used your, your, your terminology, but I do think the concept is absolutely deeply incorporated into the GDPR that now the jurisdictional reach will extend to um, entities that have data about Europeans that that is that covers their the, the European consumers' activities in Europe. But I so guess even even if the company, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Even if the company is sitting in the United sure. States. And, and I guess maybe I haven't seen it framed this way, but it seems 
correct me if you don't think it's right to frame it, it seems to me that's another added bulwark to put on top of or alongside Privacy Shield. Absolutely. That, oh, no that question. These two things now are working in cooperation. Absolutely. Too. Absolutely. And, yeah. and you can imagine that that was greatly discussed at the negotiating table. Absolutely. Um, so here's a question, not from a reporter. I, I, I'm happy to take some reporters' questions. <laughs> I just wanted, I'm sorry for teasing you about that. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, just let's clarify. The newly sure. created ombudsman, does that affect, how does that affect your role um, at the FTC? Is that going to be, is it probably going to be in a different place? Would you see cooperation, any? The ombudsman, or as, that, I, as or I understand it, uh, Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry. The ombudsman, as I understand it, is is uh, is going to solely be focused on um, signals intelligence issues. Right. Uh, so, generally speaking, I don't see any overlap in that Venn diagram. Um, the there will be a role in the Department of Commerce, which is I believe it's not being called an ombudsman, but forgive me if I'm getting the terminology wrong. But the role of the Department of Commerce will have a role to ensure that we're receiving referrals. Again, to part of the streamlined mechanism will be playing a role to try to resolve some of the easy complaints just right off the bat. So I think there'll be much more of a role um, and, and much more of a dialogue. Well, there has been a very strong and good dialogue between us and the Department of Commerce on these issues as it stands. I think Privacy Shield will um, memorialize that and, and continue to allow that to grow. That's where we'll have our um, intergovernmental interaction, I think, much more than with respect to the national security ombudsman. Sure. Okay. So maybe just a last question before sure. we, we close. Um, you know, in a way, one, one can sort of look at this kind of like as a, a, a relationship with your spouse where you haven't communicated for so long and you have all these <laughs> different things. Well, why did you do that? And, 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 you know, this answer to that obviously is more regular and honest communication. Absolutely. And I wonder, is there any talk about sort of formalizing a, a sort of European-American pr ongoing privacy dialogue where we would every year not just federal officials, but state officials would go over to Brussels and then conversely and, and really try to formalize this so that we don't get so out of sync uh, on some of these questions. I think that's a great question. Let me start out by saying I've been married now for 26 years and uh, I believe in long-term relationships. I think that they're good, but they do require work. They really do, yeah. just as you say. And uh, it's clear that um, you know, one of the benefits of these negotiations, even though they, uh, for the people sitting at the table, which, you know, I have not been at the table on a on a daily basis. The people at the table, it's been yeoman's work. It's been you know burning the midnight oil, especially over the last month or two. And they've done a, a I, I believe, on both sides, Department of Commerce as well as the um, uh, you know uh, uh, Vera Jarova's team, Jarova's team, uh, 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 Commissioner Ansip's. Team, Vice President Timmerman's team's team, all of them have just done an unbelievable job in trying to bridge this gap. It does require a lot of conversation, and I think that that process has been important, you know, yep. just at the table. But again, but now it does. It needs to be broadened. Um, there, built into Privacy Shield are some uh, are requirements for ongoing dialogue, um, you know, between the DPAs and the FTC, but also between the Department of Commerce and the European Commission over how things are going with respect to Privacy Shield. But you're asking an even broader question. You know, how do we have dialogue on a more regular basis about privacy and data protection yeah, generally? Yeah. So, I mean, whole sets of different uh, data anonymization Absolutely. questions, which I think a lot of confusion both sides of the Atlantic. Internet of things, how are we going to deal things, with, there's yeah. all sorts of issues. Yeah. Uh, and, and frankly, one of the things that I've been saying is, I believe it's important, it w has been important to bridge this uh, to, to put in place privacy shields, to, to make this bridge so that we can get to all of those very important issues that we are going to share in common that we do need to talk about. I want to mention that um, you know the United States and the German um, government do have an ongoing standing process uh, with meetings and bila bilateral uh, meetings and then public meetings dealing with cybersecurity. I think that's been a great, it's sort of a biannual mm -hmm. thing. It's been a great uh, mechanism to have exactly as you're saying these open lines of communication. I, I think that would be that would be terrific. I'll put in a plug for um, the Privacy Bridges Project, which came up at the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners. 
uh, which was designed, it was, it was a year-long uh, uh, project that was run by academics and think tanks to kind of pull together some principles that would allow precisely those, that kind of dialogue on these broader issues mm -hmm. to take place. Mm -hmm. I think it's been really important to get Privacy Shield in place sure. first so that we could cross that bridge and go to this land where we do have all of these issues that we need to deal with, and they're, they're global issues. They're global issues. Sure. They're not U.S. issues. They're right. not Europe issues or Fran France issues or Germany issues or U.K. issues. They really are global issues, and we do need to deal with them together. Well, Europe and America really should be the ones taking the lead on setting the framework. Not that we wouldn't involve others, but we're the ones who've been thinking well, about this. The there are lots of other very important regions. Uh, Asia is a deeply important sure. region, but I do think the world is watching us, and I hope the world sees that we we, we accomplished something very important. Yeah. Well, uh, with that, uh, Commissioner, I want first of all thank you for all the hard work I know that you and your team and, and others in the federal government did, uh, where they didn't see their children for weeks at a time. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think people oftentimes forget that when they think about how government works. That right. a lot of people spend a lot of hard. Effort Especially uh, on the USG side, you know, a real huge shout out to the Department of Commerce team, Penny Pritzker's team, uh, you know, Secretary Pritzker's team, uh, you know, Justin Antonio Pillay and Ted Dean, I think, you know, um, have been living in Brussels for yeah. a long time and they, yeah. they do have little children. Yeah. yeah, the only good thing of that is maybe they avoided the snowfall. I think they, uh, they may have, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so with that, uh, well, thank you all for watching, and, uh, and really thank you, Commissioner, for, for joining us today and explaining this pretty complicated but super important issue, and we'll, hopefully it'll move forward in the right way and, and we'll get it all uh, set up and resolved. I certainly hope so, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that and to answer questions that people may have. Great. Thank uh -huh. you.